Welcome to the SVG TV News, Friday, March 1st. I am Khalil Cato with the details. Today, St. Vincent and the Grenadines handed over the pro tempore presidency of the Community of Latin America and Caribbean, CELAC, to Honduras at the 8th summit of the 33-member grouping at the Sandals Resort SVG. Honduras President Xiomara Castro will hold the presidency of CELAC until 2025. Addressing today's opening ceremony of the summit, SVG's Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, the Honorable Kiesel Peters, provided the heads of state and other delegates with a report on SVG's pro tempore presidency of CELAC 2023. Minister Peters noted that the 2023 work program for SVG's pro tempore presidency drew on the foundation document of the Buenos Aires Declaration of the Seventh Summit, which identified a number of priority areas to advance the regional agenda. She said they narrowed down the 13 thematic areas into smaller groupings, on which she said significant progress was made, and for which follow-up action is necessary for the new pro tempore presidency. These areas include economic recovery, social and human development, environmental sustainability, institutional strengthening, and external relations. On economic recovery, Minister Peters says the SVG Pro Tempore Presidency, or PTP, focused largely on promoting efforts towards a regional approach on post-pandemic recovery strategies in critical sectors of the economy. In this regard, we collaborated with the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, ECLAC, the Latin American Development Bank, CAF, and other partners in hosting meetings of CELAC, Ministers of Finance and the Economy in Chile and in Spain, together with the European Union Economy and Finance Ministers, to exchange on viable strategies to address these challenges. The PTP gave due consideration to science, technology and innovation as being pivotal to the region's development. Consequently, a meeting of ministers and high authorities championed by Venezuela was held in Caracas to set the policy framework for further engagement and this was complemented by the work of a technical working group of experts to map out and recommend a pathway towards the possible creation of a regional center for science, technology and innovation. The initiative led by Mexico to promote the Latin American and space agency, ALSE, as a regional project is a critical component of the region's drive towards the promotion of science, technology, and innovation in harnessing the potential of space solely for the purposes of improving the livelihoods of the citizens of the member states of CELA and as an instrument for development. Of utmost importance within the economic recovery process was the success achieved in obtaining the 2015 San CELAC, that is, the CELAC Plan for Food Security, Nutrition, and Poverty Eradication. Several meetings of ministers of agriculture and food, as well as a technical working group, were held to discuss with relevant stakeholders and develop the draft plan. The support of the FAO, AICA, and ECLAC, among others, was critical to the success of the updated plan. Today, we can proudly table before the heads the CELAC Plan for Food Security and Nutrition 2030. In regards to social and human development, Minister Peters said the SVG PTP identified with the proposed CELAC Health Sufficiency Plan as a priority area for attention, which was considered an important goal to move towards strengthening regional cooperation in research and development, production and distribution of pharmaceuticals, vaccines, medicines and other supplies, in which the region already has some capacity. Critical to the discussion, however, was the issue of a regional mechanism to provide an overarching regulatory framework. Other areas of education, culture and the arts, women, youth and sports, peoples with disabilities and issues of migration constitute important elements of the human and social development agenda of CELAC. While there has been slow progress on some of the relevant issues, initial discussions have however been held with important partners 
such as the Organization of Ibero-American States, the OEI, on cooperation in education and training and in culture. This is work in progress, which is expected to continue under the next PTP. On environmental sustainability, matters relating to climate change, the environment, sustainable development, and disaster risk management featured prominently in the PTP's program, given our acute understanding and appreciation of the vulnerability of all of our countries particularly the small island developing states of the Caribbean and the low-lying and landlocked countries to natural disasters. In this regard, considerable progress has been made on the CELAC Fund for Climate Adaptation and the Comprehensive Response to Natural Disasters, the acronym being FACRID, which was approved at the sixth summit of heads in Mexico. The fund is practical and of great significance to the region, aimed at strengthening the region's capacity to face the persistent and existential challenges of natural disasters. The FACRID is now operational, with at least six member states having already signed the agreement. Meetings of the steering committee have been held and funds have been approved and disbursed to three member states which have been impacted by hurricanes within the last year. Noting the pivotal role of national coordinators within the existing structure of CELAC cannot be overemphasized, Minister Peters used the opportunity to thank member states for their support of SVG during its tenure as pro tempore presidency of CELAC. At the opening ceremony, Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez, who is the outgoing pro tempore president of CELAC, told the heads of state that he was in Havana, Cuba in January 2014 at the second CELAC summit, where the Declaration of Latin America and the Caribbean, a zone of peace, was adopted and he is happy that the president of Cuba requested, and they all acceded, to the request for the 10th anniversary of the declaration commemorated and celebrated in St. Vincent and the Grenadines at the 8th Summit of Sila. In, in Havana, our country is committed to treat with our differences, controversies, and disputes peacefully through dialogue, negotiation, and other forms of settlement in accord with the sovereignty of states, and international law. A recent example of this on December the 14, 2023, in the Declaration of Argyle here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Guyana and Venezuela agreed to recommit themselves to the Latin America and the Caribbean and a zone of peace and set up modalities for the maintenance of this peace and I want to congratulate my friends the presidents of Guyana and Venezuela on this remarkable achievement and the peace is holding despite dissonances occasionally I, I, I want to endorse everything which has been said by the preceding speakers on this subject, Miguel, my dear sister, comrade sister from Honduras, the president, and, 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 and comrade Petro. And I, I just want to say additionally that there are several paragraphs in the declaration, which we hopefully will adopt later today. Several, several paragraphs deal with this particular subject. Noting that the peace and security of the region is being undermined by the easy facilitation of the export of guns and bullets, which find their ways into the hands of criminals who kill, rob, or terrorize law-abiding citizens, which they must address. And the guns and the bullets come overwhelmingly from the United States of America. They have a second amendment, the right to bear arms. And they have their own set of values, but they want those values to be made manifest in our region without our own permission. And that is why I'm so happy that the government of Mexico has taken the initiative to bring appropriate legal action against the manufacturers of guns in the United States of America, to bring them to book. And I, and, and I'm 
pleased to see that the relevant courts in the United States, they have accepted the complaint by the government of Mexico, and we are moving forward with that particular action. This is a very good initiative um, in order to help us with our peace and security in the, in the region. Having said all of that, I think it is, it ought to be clear to every wise and mature person that imperialism and hegemony are the natural enemies of peace. Peace is thus an enduring anti-imperialist and anti-hegemonic path. Anybody who in our region who wants to embrace war, objectively speaking, is supporting imperialism and hegemony. We don't have to go that way. Justice, prosperity, civilized life and living are the handmaidens of peace. So, as the book of Psalms in the ancient Hebrew text reminds us that we must seek peace and we must pursue it. And in our case, for the good of our region and for all humanity. Thank you. One of the main items on today's agenda was the adoption of the Kingstown Declaration, which Prime Minister Gonzales was hoping to have adopted unanimously. Also addressing the opening ceremony of the 8th CELAC Summit was UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez, who is visiting SVG for the first time. His Excellency said he was happy to do so and paid tribute to this continent of peace in a world at war. The UN chief highlighted four areas for consideration, including that of unity and peace, noting that Latin America and the Caribbean have shown how unity for peace is possible and makes a difference. We have just witnessed it today. The peace process in Colombia has made significant strides with invaluable contributions from CELAC countries. The joint declaration for dialogue and, between, uh, and peace between Guyana and Venezuela adopted here in Argyle last December, is another example of the region's commitment to seek peaceful solutions, and I commend your efforts. Yet both cases also underscore that implementation requires sustained efforts. And we also know that peace is far more than the absence of armed conflict. Today, violent and organized crime continue to plague many countries. Arms trafficking has become the most important security threat to the region. And it will not be possible to fight it effectively without much stronger international cooperation from the source to the streets. Ecuador is the most recent example of how the security situation can quickly deteriorate and spiral into violence. I welcome the new security partnership launched in January by the Indian community. In Guatemala, the new government offers a chance to advance democratic development, the rule of law, and other key aspects of the peace agenda. Expressing solidarity for sustainable development, the UN Secretary General pointed out that the UN Sustainable Development Goals are quickly slipping away, with millions of people in the region facing poverty and hunger. He welcomed the pledge by member states of CELAC for food security and nutrition, and the dedication to end hunger by 2023. However, he noted that such ambition requires funding, as this may be difficult with many countries already drowning in debt. The global financial system is failing to provide affordable long-term finance to countries in need and to offer a global financial safety net. Small island developing states have been particularly hit. Middle-income countries are also not getting the help they need. Despite their vulnerabilities, they are not receiving the benefits of critical debt relief and concessional funding. These must change. And that shows the importance of the adoption of the multidimensional vulnerability index. Last September, world leaders endorsed our proposed SDG stimulus of 500 billion US dollars per year in affordable long-term finance for developing countries. And the stimulus also calls for a debt lifeline to give countries breathing room and the expansion of contingency financing for countries in need. Unfortunately, the resistance has been severe. And so it's important that the, vital, the summit of the future becomes a vital opportunity to make progress 
in reforming a global financial architecture that is unfair, outdated and ineffective. I look forward to your active engagement for change, for a new Bretton Woods moment, and I count on Brazil's leadership as chair of the G20. Third, we need solidarity for social cohesion. Around the world, authoritarianism and extremism are growing. Democracy and civic space are eroding. Disinformation and hate speech are supercharged by new technologies, and growing inequalities are feeding people's fears. Irregular migration has become a political tool to sow division, and it is extremely important to address all the root causes that has transformed this into a major problem for this continent. The UN chief, <coughs> excuse me, the UN chief used the opportunity to call for a renewed social contract, one which he said is based on trust, justice and inclusion, and anchored in human rights in all its dimensions. He said leaders have a responsibility to invest in a social cohesion to end violence and discrimination and to uphold the rights of indigenous peoples and ensure every community feels well represented and included and guarantee women full, full participation in leadership and amplify young voices. And now some news on the weather, where in its 72-hour weather outlook, the SBG Meteorological Service says on the southern edge of the Atlantic high-pressure system, weak unstable conditions could maintain occasional cloud patches, bringing a few light to moderate showers, alternating with fair conditions and good visibility across St. Vincent and the Grenadines over the weekend. It says varying con concentrations of, Sahara dust, of Saharan dust could create slight haze across our area during Monday, with gentle to moderate breeze increasing occasionally near 30, miles, 30 kilometers per hour and varying in direction between north-northeast and easterly across our islands. The forecast says a general reduction in wind speeds may be noticeable during Sunday with light gentle winds. Sea conditions are slight to moderate in open waters with northerly swells of 0.5 to 1.2 meters west of our islands and northeasterly swells of 1.2 to 1.8 meters east of our islands. Today marks the commencement of the National Firearms Amnesty NFA 2024. The NFA is an initiative by the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines in conjunction with the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force. The amnesty seeks to remove illegal or illicit firearms from the streets and from the hands of criminals with the objective to improve safety and security of citizens and visitors. The amnesty is a no questions asked and no prosecution initiative. The police say persons who hand over their illegal guns during this specified period will not be prosecuted or questioned about the firearms. It has also been noted that it is not a buyback initiative as no one will be paid for handing over an illegal firearm. In addition, the police, in addition to the police, persons can hand over illegal firearms to a minister of religion, head teacher, justice of the peace, parliamentarian or politician, lawyer, a lawyer or solicitor, or an, auth or an authorized firearms dealer. If you are in possession of an illegal firearm or ammunition, you're encouraged to hand them over or encourage someone who you know has a firearm or ammunition in their possession to do so during the amnesty period, which will run for 92 days. It will end on May 31st. 36 educators have died in St. Vincent and the Grenadines over the last two years. This is according to President of the SVG Teachers Union, Oswald Robinson, in an interview with SVG TV News after his re-election for a seventh term, who said that the workplace has become more stressful and that as part of the plans for the union going forward is to continue to host professional development sessions for members addressing matters of health and safety, etc. We believe that the more empowerment of our teachers training in the pedagogical skills, um, they are going to be more competent, more efficient in the classroom. So that's why I told you the Canadian Teachers Federation, we are already going to have that, they're going to come down in 2024. Each year we get four Canadians, but this time because their funding is getting less from their funding agencies, we will get three. We don't secure that. We just have to put the proposal together and lazy the Ministry of Education to get the topics. Hear from our teachers. Every workshop, there are recommendations, there are needs expressed. So we have to go back and look at those 
and make sure we take those into consideration. Health and safety. The safety of last by them, we spend a lot of time visiting schools, highlighting the infrastructural deficiencies. So we're going to work with the Ministry of Education. And so sometimes when people tell us, oh, the health system is good, I'm not going to dispute that. Uh, neither for, I'm not going to say for or against because some people take offense. But my question is, you can't tell me people are living longer. When you listen to the death announcement on this very program, one last week I listened about 20-something I hear. When I visited the Ministry of Education, the Reprographic Unit, it's in deplorable condition. And people want to tell me I must not speak about these things. They say these things are political. But if you're a trade union, anything that affects your working condition is political. You understand? The Reprographic Unit needs to be, you need to evacuate the people from there. It's unacceptable that you have people working. They have the e equipment there and they have to sit in the same space. It should not be like that. Robinson says another area that needs addressing is to have more visibility of the union in the community, particularly in the schools. He said during the term of the new executive, they will be focusing on their weak areas to have them strengthened. But the focus is on our teachers, our members. And for sure we are going to recruit more members. Yes? So we got over 100 teachers the last time. That when we had our first new members workshop, we couldn't bring all the teachers in one. That's why we are doing it in phases. We are going to work very closely with the credit union. Yes? Yeah, to do, do things together. Because teachers need to own real estates, real property. And we want to work with the credit union to see how we could get it at a cheaper than the whole that's on the market day. Because we have a lot of young, talented teachers. Our sports program, our culture programs, we're going to reform our position on those. So there's a number of proposals that will go to the executive. And those people coming on to the executive, they also have ideas. So we'll put our ideas together, prioritize them, and see what could work. Some would be long-term, some should be short-term. Robinson said another main focus of the SVG Teachers Union is to have all teachers who were affected by the government's vaccine mandate reinstated with all benefits intact. The government must reinstate all the workers in the country. I feel so sorry for the police. Yes, they told some of the teachers to come back, but the police who were dismissed, they didn't get back the job. The new recruits had already received their numbers, yes? And that is very sad. So when we talk about education and education revolution, we must have a heart and look out for those who are suffering. Many teachers have their children today to provide an education for. And if they don't have a job, if their conscience are being violated by a law, remove the law. Remove the law. You can't tell people come back to work. And when they go back and they apply for their vacation leave, you're telling them they didn't work long enough. Huh? They're asking for their vacation, they, 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 they're not getting it. And you're telling some people now they have now been appointed in a position that they were appointed long years ago. This thing is demonic. And all those who who aided and abetted, God will bring judgment upon them. The new elected officers of the SVG Teachers Union are expected to be installed at the union's 23rd biennial convention, scheduled for April. The Youth Empowerment Program Service, YES, program is being used as a conduit by many young people in the country to better themselves. This is according to Minister of National Mobilization, Social Development, Family, Gender Affairs, Youth, Housing and Informal se Human Settlement, Dr. Orlando Brewster, who was speaking recently on the ULP Speaks program on Star FM earlier this week. Dr. Brewster said within the last year, there was an increase in the stipend for those on the YES program to help young adults be successful at the program as they navigate life. This government, we are packed with ideas. We are packed with, 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 with leaders um, who are visionary. This YES program, you know, within the last year would see an increase twice twice it was increase when we had an increase in um 
It was increased recently, I think, last year. We had an increase in the YES program, the stipend, and now it is going up again. Making, rewarding our young people. Making sure that we help them along the way. I want to touch on investing in our youth, helping you to start a business. The Prime Program, you have had many successes on the Prime Program. Assist more young entrepreneurs in agriculture and fisheries. What do you think Sabi is doing? Unleashing the blue economy. Talking to young people about getting into agriculture. It is not the most sexy profession, as I, if I can use that term. But it is an opportunity for young people. Minister Brewster says the country is witnessing the unfolding of a massive push in the hotel and hospitality industry with a number of jobs created as promised in the ULP manifesto, noting that the party's objective is to create over 2,000 jobs within a five-year period in the hotel and hospitality sector between 2020 and 2025. Sanders taking on some of those. Hundreds of jobs being created at Sanders. Holiday Inn in Diamond coming on stream soon. You know what's going to happen there. Maya Suites out at, at, at out at Diamond as well. We are seeing it before our very eyes. It's unfolding. And that is why they're getting heartache. 700 construction jobs. Right now in the country, you can't find Mason Carpenter because all of them working. Hundreds of them working. 550 call center job. We are looking at the expansion of Clare Harbour. 500 tourism related jobs. Comrade, we are making a massive push in the hotel and tourism industry. More prime. We, 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 200 fishery sectors job. We are, we, we, are, we, we are expanding the fleet expansion program. Let's talk jobs. Jobs in ICT. Beverage and food production job. What do you think these people are hiring? Stones? They want to paint a picture in this country that nothing is happening. And there's a high rate of unemployment. That is the picture they're, creating, they're trying to, to paint. But you're seeing it before your very eyes that that is not so. Ambassador of the Republic of China, Taiwan to SVG, Her Excellency Fiona, Fiona Hui Chun Fan, and Minister of Agriculture, Forestry, Fisheries, Rural Transformation, Industry and Labor, Saboto Caesar, this week co-hosted the presentation of the Backyard Gardening and Climate Smart Agriculture Program and Donation Ceremony at the North Union Secondary School. At the ceremony attended by Ambassador Fan and Minister Caesar, hand trays of seedlings were handed over as well as seed packs to the school. A news release says Ambassador Fan spoke on the 43-year-long friendship between Taiwan and St. Vincent and the Grenadines, which she said focuses significantly on the collaborative efforts in the agricultural sector. The ongoing improving vegetable cultivation management and post-harvest handling project aims to bring innovation and improvement to the field, pledging to minimize agriculture product loss through cutting-edge techniques. A key highlight of the a key highlight of the initiative is the seed donations provided to all participants. Ambassador Fan stressed that these seeds represent not just potential crops, but a brighter and more sustainable future. Participants seasoned, participants, seasoned farmers or aspiring agriculture students were encouraged to leverage the seeds to their fullest potential. Minister Soboto Caesar expressed his gratitude for Taiwan's substantial contribution adding that education not only equips people with needed skills and knowledge, but also gives them a brighter prospect in their career opportunities. He said, that in the, he said that the ongoing project and agriculture program provided by Taiwan will train local farmers and workers and will help St. Vincent and the Grenadines grow a stronger economy.